and thank you for coming today um, to our last public program for our fall exhibition, um, Re-Narrating a Master, Craft Reflections on Keith and Kari. Today's craft talk features Dr. Suzanne Schmidt. Suzanne Schmidt, PhD, University of Washington, is a writer, professor, and parent who teaches justice, community, and leadership program at St. Mary's College of California. She also teaches the jam term class, Craft as a Pedagogy of Hope. Her research examines realistic, realist and literary craft narratives and the role of crafting labors in domestic fiction and multi-ethnic American literature. As education director for the Social Justice Sewing Academy, Schmidt consults on teaching and learning strategies for SJSA workshops and public programs. She taught drop-in sewing ESL classes at Southwest Youth and Family Services in Seattle, Washington, while completing her PhD. Recent publications include an article in the Journal of Migration and Development titled Precarious Craft, a Feminist Commodity Chain Analysis, and in the book chapter titled Craft as a Pedagogy of Hope, in Crafting Dissidents, Handicraft as Protest for the American Revolution to the Pussycat. Pussy Press. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne. The surface of each one rather than going into a narrow scope and greater depth. So this semester I'm teaching in the program of Justice, Community, and Leadership uh, an elective class called Practicing Arts-Based Inquiry for Social Change. It's an upper division elective that meets the um, graduation requirement of artistic analysis. And in my syllabus, I framed the class according to the following questions. What are the benefits of exploring social justice topics through art? How does creativity cultivate new possibilities? And in what ways can arts-based, hands-on, creative pedagogy be used in the classroom and in public to facilitate critical thinking. Since August, we've met in the museum regularly for guest speakers and hands-on workshops in ceramics, facilitated by the artist Kari Marble, uh, paper mache, altered photos, embroidery, and textile art with the Social Justice Sewing Academy. Over the past three months, I've had the opportunity to contemplate the work on display from many different angles. And um, this is a new one standing so close to it, <laughs> doing a talk. Um, today I'll begin by offering an interpretation of Keith and Kari that connects to my own research on craft narratives. And I'll conclude with some reflections on the role of craft pedagogy in higher education, which was a motivating question for the class I'm teaching this semester. Um, in this exhibit, I read Marbo's work as constituting a feminist response to ceramic history and art or craft history more broadly. As she enters the archive, combs through it, and find what, finds what's useful for herself, for a contemporary audience, and for the present moment. In doing so, she poses questions to the archive that challenge its established hierarchies and in, instigate new reflections on revered works such as the paintings in the William Keith collection, which we're all sitting really close to, that um, through the seemingly tireless work of Brother Cornelius provided a founding rationale for this very museum on the campus of St. Mary's College. Um, we've been studying Corita Kent's work also as one of the organizing principals for the class and she was um, very engaged with her students and I was charmed to find out that in that glass display just outside the museum there are adobe bricks that were part of the original art museum on campus and Brother Cornelius actually started to create those Adobe bricks with his students when he um, just felt discouraged that there was never going to be a museum built on campus. Um, so Keith's work has been engaged by a contemporary audience primarily from an environmental justice lens and there was a panel a few weeks ago on campus. Scholars have noted his relationship with John Muir, the National Parks Movement, and a particular view of land conservation that sought to erase all human presence from the land. Um, which led to the, its conservation, but that also included indigenous peoples. Marble's work in dialogue with Keith's landscape paintings and museum director Lauren McDonald's curation offers a new approach to Keith. And I suggest that this exhibit practices a feminist methodology for making museum collections more inclusive, more expansive, and more relevant to a wider audience by inviting us all to participate in re-narrating the paintings of William Keith. Uh, he was coined by Brother Cornelius as California's old master, and so that's where I got the title of the talk, Renarrating re a Master. It's also interesting for me because the master narratives of art history are something that I see challenged with this exhibit. 
Marbo's exhibit literally re-narrates the master narratives of California art through its focus on place, value, history, and the hierarchies of art. My own research also concerns narratives, specifically those related to craft. If we approach narratives as both produced and powerful, we can then participate in reframing them. This contention about the force and the malleability of narrative undergirds my research on craft narratives in which I've theorized four dominant narratives in the realm of craft that have significant implications in terms of who and what is valued by museum visitors, by curators, by artists and makers, by consumers, and in the culture as a whole. Studying the relationship between narrative and value has been a focal point for the class I'm teaching this semester, and later in the talk I'll explain how. Uh, to return to the exhibit, Kari Marbo calls herself a ceramic detective who, flat, quote, flattens as many data points as possible about the history of ceramic objects in order to create new narratives about their true history, or in parentheses, what you perceive to be its true history, and to intertwine that history with our present moment. This quote is taken from a worksheet that Marbo created to accompany an exhibit at A plus B projects called Duplicating Daniel. And um, it's something that I used in my class this semester that found students um, in the role of ceramic detective going into the nearest bathroom and looking at the ceramic sinks and toilets to learn more about them. Um, so the image of squishing one thing, uh, in this example, data points into something else, a true history or what we perceive to be a true history, is especially fitting for an artist working primarily in clay. And, oops, I missed this slide. I wanted to just show a short video of another ceramicist, um, Gerardo Monturubio, who my class has studied this semester. This is a clip from the series Craft in America, the Neighbors episode. For me, it's not only teaching the material, the techniques of clay, the safety involved, but also it's about opening doors uh, of opportunities, doors of creativity. I mean, who, who isn't fascinated by clay, right? And once you see somebody using this lump of dirt and making something on the wheel is somewhat magical. And I'm going to squeeze, and I'm going to follow the clay. I don't think clay has any nationality, right? Because it's a material that has been used for thousands of years by people before there were even nations. And so I think when people learn to work with clay, they access something that is very human, something where skin color or nationalities or political beliefs or religion or gender has nothing to do with it, yeah. But really, honestly, the most important aspect of ceramics is just to like do things over and over again until it's perfect. So um, the last image was the one that I really wanted to focus on in particular because when in the museum guide, when they have the quote of like flattening out data points, I think about that artist um, just squishing the beautiful vase that he just threw and everyone sort of gasping at it. Um, and I just want to make a point also about the quote there where he was talking about the universality of clay. Um, he's not. Uh, because Monterubio was talking earlier in the episode about how this medium has historically not been accessible to people like him. Um, he was an immigrant from Mexico and he just talked about how it can be really expensive to take ceramics classes. Another um, artist who's visited our class, Sarah Trail, has also talked about that from the perspective of quilting and textile arts, that um, buying quilting fabric can be incredibly expensive. and so. Um, you can see Monte Rubio in a teaching role, and then Sarah Trail with the Social Justice Sewing Academy has also really seen as um, an important part of their work the opening up of these mediums to wider audiences. And so for me, I connect that also to Marbo's question about how do we, what do we do about the prevalence and prioritization of white men in the narrative of contemporary ceramic history? Is it possible to use that lens as a starting point for dismantling that very same lens? In new, a new piece is commissioned for and displayed in Keith and Kari at this Museum of Art. Marble's ceramic and mixed media display takes Keith's paintings off the wall and in a certain way puts them in the viewer's hands. Her process, as I understand it, was as follows. 
First, she selected Keith paintings that represent three Bay Area sites, Lake Lagunita, Stinson Beach, and Mount Tamalpais. Then through copious research, including reading Brother Cornelius's biographies of Keith, interviews, site visits, um, and you can see in this image here, there's, I think, a, a printout of the catalog of William Keith, and then there's sort of notes here, and then one of, the one up here says Mount Tam, question um, mark. So she did all this research. She corresponded with experts on the moon surface and ceramic glazes, and informed by all of this research and by collecting all of these data points, Marble produced, collected, and commissioned pieces that taken together invite us to consider our own place in the landscapes that are a subject of this selection of Keith's paintings. Although the exhibit lacks a tactile component for the visitor, Marbo's non-functional sculptural ceramics evoke domestic objects such as bowls, so the moon bowls that are a few rooms over, or for me, I think because I have young children, the um, piece right over here that really um, makes me, so familiar objects like a low bowl that you can buy at Crate and Barrel or um, I always think of fun, a fun factory machine, no offense, Kari, um, <laughs> but I wanted to just kind of show that image of, you know, the Play-Doh machine my kids have at home that produces, um, at the end of this night ad from 1980s, the kid says, I made spaghetti. And she's also included in the exhibit other found objects that we have each handled. Soil, um, so some of it's on display back there or a trail map that we might have in our glove compartment. So we don't have to work too hard to imagine how they were created. And Marbo um, has done a couple, oops. She has done a couple, or she did a workshop here last month and then has also generously posted a video on the St. Mary's website that talks about her process and, and teaches you how to make um, structures that are similar to those that are on display right over there on the wall. So this familiarity with the objects in the exhibit combined with Marbo's affiliation with the role of detective calls to mind for me, craft theorist Glenn Adamson's contention that the very materiality of craft objects offers a textile connection to the process in which they were made. Adamson writes, craft objects are special because every one is a pathway back to the immediate process of its creation. If you know how to read the object, you can walk this pathway back and forth decoding the process and then finding renewed appreciation for the finished object. Thinking through craft means turning art inside out for people, showing them what has gone into its making. This explanation of why craft objects are special can be read in at least two ways. In the first interpretation, one encounters a sense of craft objects possessing a true nature. This implies that craft objects may be perceived falsely as well. Um, and for me, this is a nod more towards uh, like the established canon of art history that talks about like one particular way to interpret a piece. Capturing the immediate process of an object's creation or having someone show them how to read an object suggests that there's a correct way to decode the narrative process. I prefer a second approach with which I believe aligns more closely with Marbo's work. Adamson describes walking back and forth or turning an object inside out and then presumably right side out once more as a way to interpret craft. To me, this suggests a more indefinite process, one that might produce many new narratives about the history of a place and how that place intertwines with our present moment. In Marble's work, data points about the location of Keith's paintings include the narratives of park visitors, a wiffle ball player's autograph on the wall back there, um, these ceramic circles that represent each conversation Marble had with a park visitor. Um, and was this done during COVID? Okay, in part, yeah, so no small task to undertake during a cold pandemic, as well as a quote from Brother Cornelius's encyclopedic two-volume biography of Keith that is painted with slip on a large canvas. Um, and that quote talks about, uh, it sort of attests to the imperfections of art histories, even copiously researched biographies. There's a sentiment in the quote that's on the wall about how, like, even though he did so much work, some of it is surely not precisely accurate. This quote is hung beside the biographies and of course the final data point are the Keith paintings themselves. By composing all these artifacts as data points and kneading them together and placing them maybe not exactly on equal footing but at least in a shared context, we are invited to reinterpret the works. Um, students in my class who are here today might be thinking of contemporary mixed media artist Charles Gaines. 
um, who talks about how he doesn't know exactly what people will get out of his art, but he wants to put them in a shared context. And so cognitively, we can make a relationship between objects that are unrelated, but he says it produces sentiment and um, everyone is put into the same cognitive space and what they do with it depends on their experience and not mine. And I see a real affinity between that idea and this exhibit, um, especially since the three sites are not too far from here. And so it does make me want to go to Simpson Beach and these other places and, and place myself into these landscapes as well. I called Marble's work a feminist response to ceramic history for the way in which she questions established hierarchies. And for museums like the St. Mary's Museum of Art, this exhibit presents us with a creative methodology to address archives that historically have not privileged the voices and perspectives of women and people of all marginalized genders or people of color. Um, so one, a shout out to the museum for their recent reaccreditation with the American Alliance of Museums which is the highest national recognition awarded to museums in the US. They just found out about that. It's amazing. Um, and I think that they have a, a special kind of challenge with their archive because they are so well known for the William Keith collection. Um, Britt was sharing with me that like they're still getting people donating to that. They're also really well known for California art of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And so because of that, people continue to, dem to, to donate to the museum that further populate sort of the standard demographic of museum collections. In the article, the feminist museum hack, artists Darlene Clover and Kathy Sanford make an argument for museums as important pedagogical spaces in adult education. And um, while college students are not always included in that demographic, I definitely can say that this has been an important pedagogical space for my students this semester, and I so appreciate the museums welcoming us into this space so many times. Um, they also note that as important cultural institutions, people have been socialized to absorb museum exhibitions as authoritative or definitive interpretations whose legitimacy goes unquestioned. The feminist hack is meant to disrupt and rewrite museum narratives. And I really see that exemplified in Keith and Kari for the invitational nature of the work. Marble's focus on narratives, on research, and also talking back to an exclusionary archive do just that. Um, for me, the objects in this show, the pathway back to the immediate process of creation is circuitous and perhaps not meant to be followed, but rather reproduced in our own ways. And this isn't Marble's first foray into the reframing of, oops, I think we're not going to do that, into the reframing of ceramic history on these terms. To me, it's similar to earlier work such as Duplicating Daniel, in which Marbo investigated and recreated, albeit in inexact terms, a ceramic sculpture that had gone missing from the Mills College Art Museum collection. Again, Marbo enters the archive and combs through it to find what's useful for herself and for us. And in this exhibit, she's posing questions such as what has changed and what has stayed the same. The materials accompanying duplicating Daniel probe a bit more specifically asking, what does inclusivity mean for ceramic history, both for and beyond identity? Are stories different from histories? What is the relevance of archives and what responsibility do we have for archives? According to museum director McDonald, Marble's process is about gaining knowledge surrounding the complex histories and narratives tied to place. And she creates sculptural objects and materials that interpret this complexity through a style of impactful simplicity. Okay. Um, so with these questions about um, how to engage with these pieces and what is the difference between art and craft, you may have noticed that I'm using those terms somewhat synonymously and interchangeably, and I'm not alone. So Marble's workshop in November was called Ceramic Craft. Um, let's see here. I thought I had a, there we go. There's the flyer for it. Um, but it was here at the Museum of Art. And then there was a quote earlier about craft objects um, as special that insists that thinking about craft means turning art inside out. And I don't know how um, you feel Kari, specifically about the term of craft or the concept that is sort of um, maybe more 
I guess less revered than artists, which would be crafter. Um, but I do know that you teach at the California College of the Arts and they dropped cr and craft from their name in 2003 to not a small amount of controversy. And so here um, we see an artwork by LJ Roberts, who was a student there at the time. And um, they had installed and crafts and it's made of, I think, fiberglass and yarn. And since then, this has become a part of the permanent collection of the Oakland Museum of California. And Roberts really sees, Roberts embraces the term craft because of its, because of its history. So it has been associated with the feminine, the amateur, with colonial subjects. Um, and so kind of like the way that queer has been reappropriated, Roberts sees that similarly with the concept of craft. So here's where I'll segue into my own research on craft narratives. Some of the questions that I ask are found in slightly different form right here on the worksheet that I showed you. Um, so Marble was asking, what is undervalued in ceramic history? How do information objects and people become devalued? And my hint there is narrative. Um, so the vignette that I'm about to read about is um, concerns mask making in early, early in the COVID-19 pandemic. And it helps to illustrate these questions and segue into my research on dominant or master craft narratives. In the spring of 2020, the art or the act of sewing at home proliferated due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In a matter of weeks, everyone seemed to know someone who was sewing homemade masks or to donate to frontline workers and then shortly thereafter sewing them for their, from themselves. Is anyone wearing a homemade mask? I have altered this one, but it's not. Oh, yes, my partner. Um, so <laughs> in the same moment, abruptly unemployed garment workers were suddenly offered work sewing masks for manufacturers who had shuttered due to canceled orders, shelter in place restrictions and concerns over the spread of the virus. Minha T. Pham, a craft theorist, recently published an article that calls attention to the glaring contradiction of what she calls quarantine feminism that simultaneously celebrated those constructing masks at home as quote, Rosie the seamstresses while failing to acknowledge workers within the US and worldwide who are making similar per personal protective equipment for industrial manufacturers, oftentimes also in their homes due to the nature of the global garment industry. For meager wages, little job security and no benefits, these workers constructed PPE to little fanfare while increasing their exposure to the virus when we understood so little about how it spread and its severity. Fam digs into the roots of this cultural moment, demonstrating how it was interpreted in gendered and racialized terms and writes, at home mask making in the context of COVID-19 is being interpreted as a gendered form of civic participation based on traditionally feminine skills of sewing and crafting as well as moral, spiritual and cultural uplift. Rosie the seamstress is uplifting, but it also is a narrative that pushes women of color, low income women and immigrant women to the margins of the US cultural and social imaginary thus threatening to erase them from the historical memory of COVID-19 and also of World War II. Pham's succinct depiction of how dominant narratives in this historical moment further pushed garment workers to the margins rings true in my own research, which reads dominant narratives of craft alongside a novel featuring sweatshop and home-based sewing. In these readings, I propose a slight revision to Pham, um, which is to assert that Dominant narratives such as those that she calls quarantine feminism don't erase marginalized experiences. Instead, they rely, they actually rely on a dichotomy that is othering the experiences of women of color, low income and immigrant workers to build their own coherence. Um, it's like the juxtaposition is building the value for the Rosie the seamstresses. I call the narratives like those depicted um, in mask making at home, at quarantine feminism, realist craft narratives. The realist component notes that all narratives are produced, even those that circulate as fact. Realist narratives include statements by artisans about their work, descriptions of craft by associations, museums, and guilds, reviews of craft featured in magazines, gallery guides, museum labels, and historical studies of craft. These narratives are commonly taken at face value as simple descriptions. However, by understanding them as realist narratives, a concept that I extend from feminist commodity chain analysis, we're better equipped to explicitly name and consider the implications of these narratives. 
by casting what is said and written about craft as realist narratives, we can act, see how they actively make use of and reconfigure social constructs like gender and race to elicit certain perceptions, sometimes knowingly, but other times un unwittingly, about craft, craftspeople, their labors, and the value placed upon them. Perceived as realist narratives, they then can be subject to critical analysis that offers new possibilities for interpreting craft or for re-narrating craft. These include considering how reproducing and consuming certain types of dominant craft narratives may narratively exploit uh, marginalized workers. Okay, and I'm almost at time, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, so to further clarify the affinity between Marble's line of inquiry and my own research, I return to her set of questions about how information objects and people become devalued and who decides what's valuable. We see narratives functioning to overvalue or devalue objects, people, and information in all realms of craft, art, and culture. And in my research on textile and craft, I'm especially interested in the persistence of a stark dichotomy between handmade and mass produced. Um, so one of the dominant narratives that I write about, I've called made well by hand. And so um, it's the time of year when people are going to like holiday craft fairs. And so you might actually encounter something that looks really similar to something that you could buy at Target for much less money, but it's at the artisan craft fair because it is made well by hand. Um, certainly there's more, like there's industrial production in the realm of ceramics, but when you get to garment, um, garments that we wear, it's, it's a little bit more sticky because again, the nature of the gar global gar garment industry is not like the old school 19, not all the old school 19th century factories where people are like in a tall brick 10 story building. It oftentimes is piecework. And so you see women bringing those pieces home. So they are actually sewn by hand in their homes and oftentimes in concert with children and other family members. Um, so that distinction becomes more complicated. Okay, so to close up, my students and I have mobilized the study of artists, their techniques and their engagement with social justice topics this semester to ask, um, what do, why do creative approaches to acquiring and demonstrating knowledge appear, disappear at a certain age? In this class, students explored how arts-infused learning plays an essential ro role in imagining and ultimately creating a more just society. So we did learn in traditional ways through readings. We've read a lot of the chapters in this book, but we also viewed videos, visited museums, and each Friday students acquired a different art practice that they could consider for their final creative intervention, which they half of them presented today and half of them are presenting Friday in class. Um, and they have included a fair amount of paper mache. I think the subtitle to my class this semester is also 101 Things We Can Do With Newspapers. Um, so we began the semester by practicing artistic analysis to get a vocabulary to talk about art via case studies of artists and arts-based pedagogies. And we were also thinking about how art is influenced by and influences social change. So the artists that we profiled in the class, like Karita Kent, sort of had a more, had, a, had some sort of engagement with social justice topics. Um, and a case study from our class that comes to mind for me is that of local artist and professor Stephanie Siuko, whose work also seeks to talk back to the archive through her altered photos. And um, you can see this is an, this is Sioka's work, and then this is an example of um, we did an activity in class where students I had my collection of newspapers, and they chose an image and then decided how they wanted to alter it. And important to that process was thinking about what is the given cultural context of this piece, and then what am I going to do to this image to talk back to it or to to re-narrate it. And this is my student, Nicole. Um, and you can see uh, her rationale for the alteration at the bottom. So learning in our class has been both theoretical and hands-on. In the first half of the semester, students explored the efficacy of artistic practice as a mode of learning and also a method of assessment, in part through their own research projects. For their midterm, students were, were asked to engage in a research project around sort of the guiding question for our class. And so I found many students who focus on the benefits of hands-on and non-traditional modes of learning as a way to create more accessible classrooms. 
that were shown to have distinct benefits for students both with and without disabilities. Guest speakers and I instructed in various creative practices such as paper mache, collage, and embroidery as a means to sharpen their analytical skills and demonstrate learning and thinking in new ways about art and justice, but also to explore non-normative ways of engaging in course material and class discussion. And in doing so, and I also really encourage students to bring their topics from other classes they were taking into our conversations. So they deepen their knowledge on topics um, about such as environmental justice, imperialism, patriarchy, education reform, and racial justice. They've considered their own role in affecting positive social change. And importantly, and this was on the course description, students did not need to self-identify as quote unquote creative to succeed in this class. Um, and there's a few more images of what we did. I designed the class for a number of reasons. First, I'm someone who expresses my own creativity in many different ways. Um, teaching is one of them, but I also sew and garden and cook and do paper mache, which one of my students located as an important life skill that was learned in class this semester. Um, and then, as Britt mentioned, I've taught sewing classes for adults and youth, and I've also taught friends and family members how to sew at my own kitchen table. I've taught at the college level for nearly 16 years, but prior to this class, with the exception of the Jan term class that I teach where we do textile art, I haven't brought these two worlds together, and so I wanted some time to write assignments that allowed students to demonstrate their learning in modalities other than writing. And I found that it worked. Um, it was great to set aside time to design curriculum that allowed students to both acquire and demonstrate learning in non-standard ways. A lot of the JCL students who are in the class will go on to become educators, but in our program, there wasn't an explicit artistic analysis or creative practice class. Um, we are a liberal arts school, and so students are taking those in other programs, but I've noticed um, with my own children who are seven and 10, they really were using a lot of art and creative practices in the classroom, especially in those like pre-literate stages of learning. And so I wanted my students to have experience doing stuff like this that they might bring into their future classrooms. And I also noted and regretted that my own college track high school education didn't afford space for art classes. And the classes on that track didn't include creative practices. And my students in class, we've talked about this and they've affirmed that experience. Um, the final piece was at this particular moment, this was my first experience teaching in the classroom during COVID. I did have colleagues who were like room and Zooming last year, um, but I felt like there was a real argument to be made for augmenting hands-on learning for social and maybe even therapeutic or healing purposes in a classroom right now when we've been like commanded to stay six feet apart for so long and that's so counter to a lot of parts of human nature, um, it felt great for us to be, you know, getting our hands dirty. Um, so to close, I just wanted to read a few reflections that students have shared with me over the semester to demonstrate how they understand the benefits of exploring social justice topics through art, as well as the role of creativity in cultivating new possibilities. So this is from a worksheet that I gave them in class on Monday. and. Um, I did put some of the quotes up here, and some of them are also written on these rings. Um, during the second to last week of class, we came up with the idea of riffing off of Kari's conversation rings and also do, giving you a chance to do more paper mache. And so everyone made at least two rings, and then on them, they wrote some reflections from class. So students have learned that rules are important, but they should also be, there should be some room for freedom and inspiration. You don't have to finish what you thought you would and look for art in everything and learn to fail. Another student said there's space for creative intervention everywhere. It's okay to use references. You don't have to come up with something completely new. Um, that's a big piece of the Krita Kent. She um, has one assignment where she says, go to the library, choose the first five books that are read, and then make something with the text in those books. Um, Students shared that thinking about the way art is positioned and who is allowed to position these things really made a difference. And then um, other student, another student shared that unlearning is an essential part of building and creating new knowledge. Um, thank you for coming.